Good evening and welcome to technically the second of the adult summer reading program events. Last week we had the CPR and AED classes with the paramedics of Johnson County. And tonight we have Iowa Rocks. And our guest speaker tonight is Ray Anderson. He is the vice president of the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Society. And if you ever see a car driving around town with a license plate that says Rock Doc, that's him. <laughs> that's him. And I know this because he used to be my next door neighbor. Now, I have this. This is the adult summer reading program game card on one side, but the list of events on the back. All of the adult summer reading program events, which are open to people of all ages, have to do with science and geology for rocks. Um, there are extra copies of this over on the table. Now, next Saturday, we're having an away from the library event. If you look on your sheet at 10 in the morning, we are meeting at the Devonian Fossil Gorge and the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Society members will be there to hold our hands and point out fossils. You can't take any fossils, because you can't do that up there, but they're gonna point them out, show us what we have, lead us so we don't get lost, and there might even be some of the staff that work up there that come down and join our fun, because they don't have anything else to do that day, they said. Now this is next Saturday or this Saturday after? A week from this Saturday, thank you. Not in three days. Um, and we will have handouts like this from the, who made this? Core did, I hadn't seen the that The Corps of Engineers, er, yeah. They um, sent me a whole packet of these from, actually Rock Island, and it has a map and a list of all the stuff you can find there. So we will have these to pass out, and I think I'll laminate one or two to make out into a sign that we can pass around. Now, tonight, I didn't expect so many little people in the room. <laughs> so we're going to do a giveaway, and we're going to do one per family that has little kids in the room tonight. So I need these two families to write down their names on here. And what I got is this really cool fold-out guide to the rocks and minerals of Iowa. The Burr Oak Land Trust put this together, and it's really cool. And we got ours free from the... Oh, sorry, microphone. I forgot, Bond. Thank you. I'm not used to being the speaker. I'm the introduction person. So we are going to give away these to the kids so they can learn to identify the rocks and fossils and things. And if I don't already have your name written down on a piece of paper, find me at the end of the program and we'll write it down. But since she was the first one in the room tonight and the most excited, you get that. You're welcome. All right, so on with the show. Ray Anderson, take it away. Well, thank you all for coming, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about collecting rocks in Johnson County, Iowa. Now, that's kind of tough to do. As you know, there's not a lot of places you can collect rocks in Johnson County, but I'll try to see what I can do. First of all, I'll start with a little background. This is a little geology 101. We live right here in the crust, and the crust is made up of eight major crustal elements, oxygen, silicon, aluminum, and a few other things there. So most everything in the crust is made up of those. Now those things combine to form what we call minerals. Minerals are specific combinations of these elements, and I don't know, there's something around 3,800 minerals, so I have a collection of all of them. <laughs> I have a lot of rocks, but not quite that many. And these minerals combine to form what we call rocks. So rocks are combinations of minerals. And there's zillions of types of rocks, but there's three major classes of rocks, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. So the Earth started out as a molten Earth. So we started out up here with the magma. I don't have to point with my pen. I've got a pointer. We start out here with magma, and as the magma starts to cool, it crystallizes and forms the igneous rocks. So they're formed from crystallized magma. 
Now the magma or the igneous rocks, they can either melt again or they can get metamorphosed, buried and affected by heat and, and pressure and changed, or they can get weathered away and form sediments. Now the metamorphic rocks themselves can also melt or they could be metamorphosed again, or they can get worn away and turn to sediments too. So you got all these sediments down here. They get compacted and cemented to form the sedimentary rocks. Then sedimentary rocks, it can be melted also. It can be worn down or it could be metamorphosed. So these rocks on Earth are continually going back and forth between all of these various forms, uh, albeit over a long period of time. The main ones, though, igneous, metamorphic, sedimentary. Okay, we geologists, in order to keep track of a lot of these things, we, we put names on things, and we put names on the geologic eras. The oldest of these, the Precambrian, started when the Earth was formed about 4.6 billion years ago. We geologists lots of times use MA or, or millions of years, so this is 4,600 million years, or in other words, 4.6 billion years. I'll just use this format just to be consistent, though. Okay, the Precambrian lasted until about 540 million years ago, so that was 4 billion years worth of Earth's history. 88% of Earth history is a Precambrian, and that's the farthest stuff back, so that's the stuff we know the least about. Then we get into the Paleozoic next from 540 million to 200. 48 million, that's only 6% of Earth history. And as we get farther up to the modern day, we know more and more about the rocks because they're here for us to look at everywhere. Mesozoic ended 65 million years ago. That's when the big meteorite hit the Earth and killed all the dinosaurs and marked the end of the Mesozoics. So that's only 4%, and we're living now in the Cenozoic, the upper 1% of Earth history, 65 million years. And you think that people have been on Earth about, depends on what you def, how you define humans, but something like two million years. So that's just, you know, one one hundredth of one percent of Earth history, not much. So there's Iowa. This is a geologic map of North America. It shows what types of rocks, what ages of rocks are, are at the surface where. Up in this area here, these are the Precambrian rocks, and these are almost all igneous and metamorphic rock. They're all old, older than... 530 million years ago. Most of them are a whole lot older up there. Then here where most of Iowa is, these purple and blue tones, this is a Paleozoic, the period of time between 530 and 250 million years ago, roughly. And these are almost all sedimentary rocks. As a matter of fact, I think they are all sedimentary rocks in this area. And then out beyond that are these green tones. These are the Mesozoic rocks, so they're the ones between 250 and 65 million years ago. And then finally, the Cenozoic ones are deposited most recently from 650 to today. You have sediments on the Gulf Coast. You have igneous rocks up in this area, dominantly that is. Whoops. Whoops. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Never mind. That'll explain it. Anyway, and then down in this area here, down in New Mexico, you can't have a mixture of both. And then these areas in between here are just mixtures of all these things, because these are where the mountains are, and they've been mixing everything up, and so all these rocks are all mixed up there. So this is what the, this is what the uh, geology of North America looks like. Then, most recently, the last two million years or so, the glaciers have come down, and they covered this amount of the, of the country. And as they were moving down, of course, they ground away rocks, they picked up rocks, they carried them down, and when the ice all melted, we were left with a layer of glacial till, covering up everything including all of Iowa. So we geologists that like to see rocks covered with glacial till. Not a lot of rocks. Lots of good farmland, not a lot of rocks. So it makes it a little tough. But let's take a look at the Precambrian. This was way back when, beginning about 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago when the Earth formed. We had a lot of molten rock around. Things were cooling. Meteorites were coming in. The moon was about 12 times closer to the Earth than it is now, so it was huge in the sky. Uh, it was an interesting time, and that's when a lot of these igneous and metamorphic rocks were formed. If we look at a map of Minnesota right directly north of us, all the colors in here are Precambrian Age rocks covered up by these younger Paleozoic and Mesozoic rocks. These are all Precambrian age. And a lot of the rocks that we find in Iowa uh, that come down with the glaciers were picked up in this area and carried on down. And especially, we see rocks 
They're called erratics, by the way. These, when you find a rock that has been carried in by the glacier, it's called erratic because it doesn't belong there. It's an erratic. So Iowa erratics, commonly we see granites from the St. Cloud area. And this is all the big giant boulders that we see are almost all come from there. We also see a lot of Sioux quartzite. This is really rugged material from here. It's the most durable material, most durable rock on earth, really. And we also get a lot of basalts from the mid-continent rift system, or sometimes they call them Keweenawan because that's the age of the unit. But those are billion-year-old rocks up there. So here's what they look like. If you go up to St. Cloud today, you see a bunch of abandoned quarries because they don't quarry so much up there, a little bit, but not so much. But uh, these are some of, the, some of the quarries that they used to quarry that those granites and things, and they turned into tombstones and countertops and everything. Uh, here's what some of those things look like. Now, these are just a few of the types of granite that you can find in the St. Cloud area. They're very durable rocks, so these frequently make it all the way down to Iowa. Here's an example of how we classify these rocks. If we look at this, this is a piece of granite here. If we look at it, we see it's got feldspars in it. That's those orangey colored things. It's got hornblends in it. Those are the black colored things. It's got mica in it. They're kind of gray colored things. And it's got quartz in it. That's uh, the kind of clear covered colored stuff. If you looked at that rock, you'd see that it has what we call a phaneritic texture. In other words, it's got all crystals. You don't see anything but crystals in there. So we go to our handy dandy rock chart and we see coarse grained rocks, and we see it's got quartz, and it's got feldspar, and it's got micas, so it must be a granite. So that makes that a granite. So that's a, there's a classification system like that for all these rocks, and I'm not gonna give you a quiz or anything, but if you wanna find out what a rock is, you can probably figure it out yourself. The Sioux Quartzite is just an incredible rock unit. It was deposited about 1.6 billion years ago. Uh, a big sand, beach that ran all the way from Canada to uh, Arizona. And uh, these, then these things were cemented together to form this mineral called quartzite. This is what it looks like. It's an incredibly durable mineral. It's about the hardest thing you can find on Earth. I don't mean hard, hard, I mean durable. It doesn't erode well. And this is why. If you look at how this quartzite is made, we have round grains of quartz, or roundish grains of quartz. And in the case of the Sioux quartzite, they have a little iron oxide red coating on them. And they're cemented together with quartz. So you've got quartz cemented together with quartz. So that's incredibly hard stuff. And if you break it, it breaks right through the grains. You can't see the individual grains on there because it's the same density as the, or same toughness as the matrix. Now, if you look at a piece of sandstone, normal sandstone, this is kind of a quartz cemented sandstone. Normal sandstones are cemented together with calcite or clay, iron oxide, or something like that. If you look at them, if you break one of those, it breaks through the cement and around the grains. So you can see the individual grains. So if we take a close look at this quartzite, and you'll see lots of this quartzite uh, in rocks that are laying around because the glacial till brought a lot of it down, you don't see the individual sand grains in that. Compare that to a sandstone where you do see the individual sand grains. Here it's breaking through the quartz grains, and here it's going around them. This makes quartz one of the most durable rocks on Earth, as I said, and consequently they use it for a lot. So if you go up to northwest Iowa, in the area where that quartzite uh, is present, you see a lot of pink highways. That's because they use that as the aggregate. It lasts a long time if you cement it together with, with cement and call it concrete, or you cement it together with bitumen and call it asphalt. Either way, it makes pink roads, and you see a lot of them up there. This is a distribution of the Sioux quartzite. Everywhere you see this, this pinkish color, that's where the quartzite can be found. Now, it's only at the surface in this darker pink color. It's covered up by other rocks in this area. And if you see that just barely gets into the corner of Iowa, and you go to the very northwestmost corner of Iowa, and what you find is Gitche Manitou State Preserve. And there's a quarry where they mine some of that quartzite there. Again, here's a little closer look at the quartzite. You see, you can't see the individual grains. It looks polished. As a matter of fact, it is kind of polished. That's an event that we call ventrifaction, and that's caused by dust grains for thousands of years blowing against this, and it literally polishes the rock. And so it looks polished. Interesting rock. 
Okay, the other one I want to talk about is the basalt. Now, the basalt is a part of what we call the mid-continent rift system. This is a big rift, a big fracture in the earth that happened a billion years ago, ran right through Iowa, up into the Minnesota area. But uh, I outlined Lake Superior a little more because that's where you see this stuff exposed, right up in this area of Lake Superior. As a matter of fact, right on the North Shore is where you can, you can go to find a lot of this basalt. So there you see the black basaltic material there. And this is what it looks like up close. I've got a piece up here if you want to see one. It's basically lava from very deep in the crust, very near the crust mantle boundary that has come up, very iron rich magma. And uh, it forms, when it cools, it forms this very dense rock basalt. Now, an interesting thing about these lava flows is when they're in the ground, they're under a lot of pressure, and any gases or anything in there are into the liquid. As it comes to the surface and the pressure is released, these gases float to the top, kind of like opening a bottle of pop, you know, and the bubbles all of a sudden come up. Same type thing. I said these bubbles come up to the top where, where the rock is cooling, and they actually get frozen into place. And those we call vesicles, these little gas bubbles. And you can see ves vesicular basalt uh, in a lot of places up there. That's the top of one of these lava flows. Now, I, unfortunately, I couldn't find a piece in my garage to show you. But, but what happens is you get lava flows on top of lava flows on top of lava flows. And the ones underneath that get buried, they get heated, they get cooked. Groundwater moves through them, carries minerals. And the minerals get precipitated inside of these little, little vesicles. And you end up with something like this, which they call a, a big deloidal basalt. And this has got uh, uh, <coughs> calcite is the, is the white mineral. Hill. Feldspar is the purpley stuff, and the green stuff is epidote in this case. Now there's a lot of native copper up there, and if you're really lucky, you can find these vesicles filled with native copper, real copper. And this is a part of this whole volcanic activity. The, the area in northern Michigan is the greatest native copper province in the world, and you can find a lot of that. I just found one today, as a matter of fact. I cut a rock in my garage, and it was just like that. I was so excited. But you can also get agates that form of those vesicles. So that's just quartz, and whenever you have quartz with colored bands in it, you can call it an agate. So you get agates in those vesicles, and agates being quartz are much harder than the granite around them is, so eventually the lake and time wears all the granite away, and all you have is the agates. So these are the famous Lake Superior agates, what we call lakers, and you can find a lot of these around Iowa. Now, as far as these three hard rocks I was describing, a railroad ballast is a wonderful place to find and collect those. I don't, probably not legal, but you're not likely to get in too much trouble. So this was an interesting picture I took one time. It had basalt aggregate there. It had quartzite aggregate down here. And it had granite aggregate up there. So you can see all three in one, one shot. So that was pretty cool. Okay, so this is a map of the Precambrian of Iowa. These, these are the Precambrian rocks, the oldest rocks in Iowa. But uh, we don't see those in Iowa because we had a situation in the Paleozoic where the seas extended over the continent and completely covered the continent. And they came back and forth a number of times. This is a really wonderful chart that my friend Brian Witzke put together that shows that. We're looking at time here in, in uh, years or millions of years, and then the period names. So we're starting out with the Cambrian at 550 million, and we're getting younger as we go up. And on this other side here, this shows a percentage of Iowa that was covered by water as these seas moved in from zero to 100%. So when the seas move in to cover the state, we call that a transgression. The seas transgressed in. When they move out, that's a regression. So each of these cycles we refer to as TR cycles, transgression regression cycles. And you see, there's just a ton of those things. through. And every time one of these comes in, they're depositing rocks in Iowa. And when it goes away and you see these brown periods, those are times when rocks are being eroded from Iowa. So we're lucky in Iowa, we can see samples of all of these various units. Johnson County has mostly Devonian rocks, a little bit of Silurian, mostly Devonian rocks, though. So we are part of several of these TR cycles. And when you get looking at it real close at any one spot, it's not just one transgression and one regression. The seas are going like this, you know, and so it's slowly working their way in. 
Okay, well, when the Devonian rocks around here were deposited, this is what North America looked like. It was two major continents, Laurasia and Gondwana, and they're working at crashing together to form a supercontinent. That'll happen a couple hundred million years later. Most of North America, most of the United States is in North America. A little bit of the Southeast is still in Africa at this time. And I was right there. Now let's take a little closer look at this. This is just kind of zooming in. Here's the equator again. There's Iowa, so we're right in tropical conditions, nice tropical seas. This is the edge of the continent right here. So out in here is where you get the typical oceanic crust and stuff. But here where Iowa is, this is just water coming up over the continent. So we have nice shallow seas. Uh, the depth is kind of indicated by the color of blue. So this is actually called the Iowa Basin right there. Illinois Basin, Michigan Basin, how about that? Those are areas where the rocks are a little, end up being a little thicker as they were deposited there. Okay, so then as time went by, those, banner, those Paleozoic rocks were eroded back to about this far. So we have Precambrian rocks exposed north, northern part of Minnesota, for instance, Wisconsin. But Iowa is pretty much covered. There's one little spot sticking through here, but I didn't put it on. And if we look at these Paleozoic rocks, this is a geologic map of Iowa that shows the various units that we see. We look at those, uh, oh, this is a stratigraphic column of Iowa, shows the, the ages of the rocks, the name of the formations, the types of rocks, all that good information on there. And we can compare that to the, the chart that we see. Now here's the Precambrian. We have rocks in Iowa as old as 2.9 billion years old, uh, and then up to about, a, about 1 billion years or so. After that, the Cambrian rocks were deposited and the rest of the Paleozoic up to there. So the Cambrian ones were here, Ordovician are next, Silurian, Devonian, there's our rocks, Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. So those got deposited one on top of the other. Then the whole state got tipped and eroded down. So the youngest rocks of the Paleozoic are here, the oldest ones up there. And the Mesozoic was deposited, that's the green rocks. They were deposited on top of that unit. And then the quaternary, we have a few quaternary rocks in Iowa, not very many, but we do have a lot of glacial till. So that's mainly what I'm going to talk about here. Okay, so here's Iowa, and of course we're right here in this purple belt, and that's uh, Devonian age rocks. And where do you go to see Devonian age rocks? Devonian fossil gorge is the best place. This is a really wonderful place to come and see the rocks, because what happened here is uh, the, the Coralville Dam filled up to maximum, went over the emergency spillway and eroded away their campground. Uh, where the campground was are these beautiful rock deposits, and they're what we call bedding plane deposits. Instead of a road cut where you're just looking at a vertical cut through the rocks, here you're actually walking around on the sea floor, and you can see some of the variations in the, the, what was the actual sea floor 375 million years ago. Pretty cool. So if you can make it out there in a couple of weeks, I think you'll enjoy it out there. Uh, this was a, one of the old charts that I made, <laughs> the core modified it. Uh, and, you, and you get one of these that, that describes the type of fossils and a little bit about the flood and that kind of thing. And uh, what, what we have is a series of discovery points. We went out and actually drilled a hole in the rock and put a little plaque down there so you could go find it and then you can read about it. So you can go to number four and find the crinoids or you can go to number 16 and find this cool fault and all things like that. So I hope you can make it out there. This is a really nice, uh, attraction to have, but be warned. Corps of Engineers doesn't like you taking the rocks out of there, and they will slap a $500 fine on you if they catch you. And this is technically true anywhere around the Coralville Reservoir, because anywhere that the Coralville Racks Reservoir can possibly flood is Corps of Engineers land, and you can't collect rocks there legally. Where's the spillway on that? Uh, spillways, uh, let's see, where are we at here? Oh, this is the apron of the dam. So the dam is over here, and the spillway is, is right over on this side. They, they actually cut a new spillway. The original, let me back up here a minute. The original river flow went right through here. They cut a spillway here, and then this was the emergency spillway that uh, performed exactly as it was supposed to, twice. <laughs> Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the Ice Ages. The Pleistocene is a name that we give to the period of time when we had all the glaciation in here. It's about two and a half million years or so. Now, we call that one Ice Age, but it really wasn't. We had 
I don't know, they don't really have a final count, but probably 10 or 11 individual ice sheets that came down in that period of time and went back. So if you look at that, 2,500 years ago up to present, and you see all of these ice sheets coming in, and you see there's a Wisconsin one, the most recent one that just departed. Uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that we're still in the middle of the ice ages, that if people cut back on the global warming a little bit, maybe the ice will come back eventually. There's a warning, the ice age is coming. <laughs> so during the Pleistocene, the glaciers were mostly restricted to the northern hemisphere, and this much of North America was covered. All of Greenland, Asia, and parts of Europe were covered. This is a map of the last of those glaciations, but it shows the, through the two spreading centers that, that we had during the Pleistocene. The snow build up in this area, piled up and piled up and piled up until the compression caused it to, to solidify into ice. And then ice, of course, is a liquid. It's a very viscous liquid, but it's a liquid. So as added weight went on, it just kind of flowed out and it flowed south down into Iowa and all the way down to Missouri uh, eventually. So there's Johnson County and the first of these series of glaciers we call the Pre-Illinoian. And we just call it that because there's a number of different glaciers that came down in this period of time between 2,500 and 500,000 uh, years ago. And uh, we really can't differentiate them, but I, we, we know of at least three or four that came through this area. The second set of glaciation is called the Illinoisan Glacier because it came mostly from that eastern spreading center, moved down this way, and one of the ice advances came over slightly into Iowa. Didn't quite make it to Johnson County but it did come into Iowa. And then the most recent is the Wisconsin, and we had a couple of different lobes of ice that came down about this far, but again, not into Johnson County. This is what fresh glacial till looks like. It's very dark, it has pebbles in it, it has sand in it, it's roughly equal parts of sand, silt, and clay with pebbles in it, kind of like your plum pudding. Those pebbles are, are cool things to collect in many cases. Now if you go up on the Des Moines lobe, where the most recent of that glaciation was, very flat country. It hasn't, this is, the glaciers only pulled out of here about 12,000 years ago, and there hasn't really been time for the rivers to develop a drainage system. So it's very flat, but this is glacial till right at the surface. Now also up in that area, you'll find what they call the knob and kettle moraine. You'll be driving along on that flat surface, and all of a sudden, here's a bunch of hills. Well, what's going on there? As the glaciers came down, uh, the ice is constantly moving. It's moving that way constantly, and it's spreading out that way constantly. And uh, at these edges, it's melting. So the, it's a kind of a combination of flowing and melting, sort of like a conveyor belt. So when this ice picks up all of these chunks of rock, et cetera, when it gets to the melting edge, it just dumps them out. So you end up with a pile of rocks and other debris right where one of these glaciers is stagnated and you get a series of rocks like this. And I really love looking at these things because these glaciers have sampled all of the rocks basically north of us, all the way up to central Canada. So you get a really variety of cool stuff. And that's where I really like to, like to do it. Now this is a glacier map of Iowa and you can see that Johnson County there. We're mostly in an area that's called, uh, called the Southern Drift Plain. It uh, has only been glaciated by those pre-Illinoian glaciers, you know. And every time a glacier comes down, it carries a bunch of ground up rock with it, you know, rock flour. And every spring and summer, those glaciers melt and they flood, the rivers flood, and they spread this silt out over the floodplain. And then in the fall, the rivers go down and the winds blow that silt up into the uplands. And that's what we call LUS, wind-blown silt. And that covers all this area down here. So you see mostly areas of rolling hills and stuff around in there. Here's the Northeast Iowa area. This is what's called the driftless area. That technically means there was no glacial drift in it. That, in fact, had two glaciers going through that area, but the, Minnesota, or the, the uh, Mississippi River being so close and stuff, all of that stuff got eroded off. So there's lots of, lots of bedrock, lots of these Paleozoic rocks exposed up in that area. This is a Des Moines lobe, the most recently glaciated area. I showed you that picture, lots of flat land, but also you get a lot of these moraines, these little features that have the sand and gravel in them. Plus, you can get sometimes just in the middle of somewhere like this, you'll find a nice sand and gravel deposit because there was a river running through the ice 
and, uh, and it deposited all that stuff in the ice. The island erosion surface is this area here. I'll talk a little bit about it later, but that's an area that is basically the same geology as down here, except it's been eroded down. And this is the area where you find lots of pebbles and stuff out in the fields and, and the fence rows and stuff. Final place to get good rocks are these sand and gravel pits, and you find those anywhere along rivers. And uh, you can see the rivers there. You get some nice sand and gravel like this, and if you look through there in the right spots, particularly over in the eastern part of the state, you can find some of these Lake Superior agates pretty easily in there. So back to Johnson County, we see we get a little bit of this Iowan erosion surface that comes into Iowa, Johnson County at the very north side. This is a more detailed geologic map, but the erosion surface are still these, these brown things here. This lobe here is called the North Liberty Lobe because the town of North Liberty sits, whoops, I'm not going to talk about that yet. <laughs> talk about where the rocks are exposed. There's a Devonian fossil gorge right there, and then you get lots of nice rock exposures all around the reservoir, all the way from here up to there where a big bedrock channel comes through and cut all the rock out. Now quarries are the best place to find these rocks and to see these rocks, but uh, you know, quarries don't normally let you in. <laughs> There's a way around that, though. Join the rock club. <laughs> the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Society up in Cedar Rapids that I'm a member of is uh, the biggest one in the state and probably is the most active. And we're actually going to host a National Society of Rock and Mineral Societies uh, show next year, national show. Anyway, if you join one of these clubs, like this one, you can get permission to come in with the club, and we go into those quarries. Uh, I, can, I think they go in probably at least a half a dozen times a year in the summertime, you know, when the, when the weather's reasonable. And if you go in there, you can find all kinds of neat fossils. There's a trilobite that was found in one of these, a uh, fish tooth. There's brachiopods. These are like little clamshells from back in the day. And you might, you might even find uh, corals. You can find a lot of interesting minerals. Calcite, of course. Calcite is calcium carbonate. That's what limestone is made of. And so you find these little pockets of nice calcite crystals. And sometimes you find these crystals terminated, these little dog tooth calcites, we call them. Pyrite is iron oxide, or iron sulfide, I mean. And you, you find a lot of pyrite in the quarry. And if you're lucky, you might even find some fluorite, which is a fluorine carbonate. And if you're real lucky, you can find some millerite, which is a really strange nickel mineral, and I don't know what the heck it's doing in the rocks around here, but these quarries are famous for having millerite. Now there's also just a lot of interesting rock types to see there. We've got breccias, broken up rocks. You see chunks of broken up angular rock uh, re-cemented together. We have this nice lithographic limestone. Now, lithographic limestone is, is basically was originally mud, that was lime mud that was turned to rock. So it's real smooth. It's so smooth in the old days, they used to polish that and etch it and use it as a printing stone. They would print papers and stuff on it. And then you can also find lots of fossils. And I got one up here, too, that you can see that's very similar to that one there. Also, you can find some glacial rocks in those quarries because they always have glacial till on top they have to strip off, and sometimes you find something like this. These are glacial striae. They're scratches in the rock that were put there when the rock was frozen into the ice and it was dragged across the bedrock and it actually scratched it. Those are actually fairly common to find. Wouldn't think so, would you? Okay, here I'm going to talk about the Iowa erosion surface. It comes down here. You can see it there. This is the North Liberty Lobe. And uh, this was taken from a hill right up above North Liberty looking across it. And you can see the other side of the lobe on the horizon there. And this big flat area is the Iowa erosion surface. Lynn County, it's almost all that way. Now here's how that formed. This started out just like that southern Iowa drift plain. Big, thick layer of lust over paleosols, old soils, and oxidized till, and then unoxidized till. What happened, that was a period of time between 1650 and 2100 years ago, 21,000 years ago, that, uh, that there was a really cold conditions. There was permafrost up here. So you had tundra type environment. And when you have a tundra, of course, you don't have much in the way of vegetation. 
But even though this was a tundra, it's still pretty far south. And in the summertime, these thunderstorms would still occasionally come up, drop a bunch of water. So you got a lot of erosion. So what happened is the, the lust got eroded off, and then pretty soon that uh, paleosols got eroded off, and you ended up with what's called a stone line. These bigger rocks that were just too heavy for the water to carry away just accumulated on the surface. Then we got a little coat of windblown lust or loam above that. And so we ended up with what we see in the Iowan erosion surface. Now this thing is what's called a paha. It's an Indian word for a hill. There's a few places like this where you get these linear ridges of uneroded landscape. So this is what the landscape used to look like. Uh, for some reason or other, it didn't erode here. I suspect maybe there were some very persistent trees that managed to hold the landscape together. But whatever the case, this is an example of a road cut where you can see that. Now here's, a, again, the Iowan erosion surface. And if we cut a road into there like this, you can see the loamy deposits up at the top. You can see the stone line and then the unoxidized pre-Illinoian till underneath. Now what happens is freeze-thaw brings these rocks up to the surface. And so this is what the fields in the Iowan erosion area would look like if farmers didn't pick all those rocks up. Of course, you don't want to plow through those, so if any of you are familiar with farming around here, you know you have to pick up a lot of rocks, and you end up piling them along fence rows or put them in a big pile somewhere. These are wonderful places to collect rocks, but these are private property. So if you do that, make sure you get permission. And, and I think most of these people pile those rocks up and leave them there because they don't want them. And uh, they'll probably be happy to let you come and sort through them if you want. This guy wanted his. i never seen so many in one place in my life. He had them piled all over around there, all around his house. It's just incredible. This was up north of, uh, north of Des Moines. Now the very largest of these glacial erratics are found on the Iowan erosion surface. This is one just east of Allison. Big boulder carried down by the glaciers, dumped there. Another one here in Nora Springs. This is right, right in the Central Park downtown. As a matter of fact, this road curves and goes around that boulder. And the mother of all erratics in Iowa, this is the biggest one we've come across so far, is uh, west of Nashua. And it's uh, about 50 feet in the long direction. It's about 11 and a half feet high. And there we go. And your guess is as good as mine how far into the ground it goes. So this was one big rock that the glacier carried down. These are Luther College students looking at it. Okay, here's a few helpful tools if you want to go out and do geologizing, you know. You got to get yourself a hammer. You don't necessarily have to have a geology hammer like that, but, but these tempered hammers are better because when you start hitting rocks with a normal hammer, the pieces of metal fly off. They even fly off here, so you better have some safety glasses. Acid bottle is pretty nice to have. Now, this is dilute hydrochloric acid, which uh, is like 5% hydrochloric acid. And why that's handy is because if you're looking at limestones, if you put a little drop of that acid on a limestone, it effervesces. The acid frees the CO2 from the limestone, and it bubbles up. Now, if you've got something that looks like limestone, you put acid on it, it doesn't bubble. It's probably dolomite. Dolomite is similar to limestone. It's got more magnesium in it. And uh, you have to get a, your hand lens down there and look at it to see the bubbling. But it's, it does bubble a very little bit. And a knife is always handy, too, just to scratch these rocks to help identify what they are by how hard they are. If you're going in a quarry or something, you'll need this kind of safety equipment. These safety glasses, of course, you ought to have those whenever you're hammering a rock. But you'll need a hard hat, steel toe boots, and a safety vest. Those are required if you're going to go into a quarry. And you can get some good literature. There's, there's a, a few books around, but these are two of my favorites for, for uh, understanding the geology of the state. This was written by Wayne Anderson at University of Northern Iowa for many years, a wonderful guy. And this one is written by Paul Garvin on Iowa's minerals. And uh, Paul was up at, at, uh, at uh, Mount Vernon for a number of years. Now, where do we find these rocks around Iowa? Well, if you want to find bedrock, the actual rock that's at the bottom, you have to go somewhere where there's not a lot of glacial till on it. So this rock is what we call, this map is what we call depth to bedrock. How far down do you have to go to find rock? 
Uh, zero to 25 is what you're looking for, because you don't want to dig through more than 25 feet of, of till to get to the rock. So most likely our exposures along here, and this in fact is the case, you know. For instance, this is up near Marquette there, and you can see lots of nice exposures up there. Lynn County, or Johnson County, I mean, you see we got some around the reservoir and a few other places where it's shallow, you can find bedrock exposed. Where do you find glacial erratics? This is the main area. Remember we said this was all covered with windblown lus, and you can find outcrops uh, and erratics down here too, but this is the best place. This is the place where these rocks work their way up to the surface and the farmers have to pull them out of the field. So you see a lot of things like this. So these are the best areas to, to collect the glacial rocks. These are the rocks that sample everything from Iowa to Canada. And sand and gravel is mostly found along rivers, and uh, there you go, typical example. Now there's not very many places in Iowa where you can go to collect rocks, but this is one where they really encourage you. This is Rockford, Iowa, is up, you know, not too far from Mason City, sorry, between Mason City and Waterloo. And, and uh, the Floyd County Fossil and Prairie Park uh, lets you come in and collect like these people are here. This is an interesting situation. This is, a, and I've got some of the fossils up here. These are a bunch of, of little fossils that are calcium carbonate fossils and they're in a shale. And the shale is what they're sitting on here. And when it rains, the shale's real soft and the, and the shale gets eroded away. And these little fossils end up sort of lining these gullies. And you can just go and pick them up just like that. And they encourage you to do that. And they're, they're Fossil Prairie Center here is a real nice learning center. They have examples of all these to help you identify them. Plus, you get a handy chart like this to help you identify these things too. This is an a important group of fossils in uh, paleontology. It's called the Hackberry fauna. It's world famous for all these interesting fossils, and they're all small, very miniature. It's called a diminutive population, and I'm not sure quite why that is. Probably all the clay was a very lousy living environment, and maybe they didn't live very long. Maybe every year a storm came by and buried them before they had a chance to grow or something like that. I don't know, but uh, a very interesting place and a very famous, famous fossil assemblage. Another place you can legally collect fossils, most areas, every area I know, but I can't guarantee you every area, is along the road ditches, because the road ditches belong to the county. And the county has to come along and clean all those things out. So if these rocks fall out into the ditch, the county's more than, hap more than happy to have you come and take it away so they don't have to do it. This is a, a road cut near the town of Graff, which is just west of Waterloo. Uh, it's called the Graff Road, as a matter of fact. And this is the interest. This is called the Maquoketa Shale, and there's some really interesting materials here. It's these things. These are, are fossil cephalopods. This is what a, what a cephalopod looks like. These are nautiloids. They're essentially squids with a shell. And I've got some samples of those up here. They're, re they're really pretty cool. Some of these guys get as big as telephone poles, but around here in this area, most of them are pretty small, and you can, you can collect them pretty easily. There's what a, a fossil from graph looks like. Okay, geodes is another good thing to collect. Now, there's a few places you can go and find geodes on your own. There's a few creeks, but again, mostly those creeks are on private property, so you have to get permission. And you can, along the Des Moines River, in a few places you can find them. But the best place to find geodes is really to go to one of the geode collecting farms where you can pay them some amount of money and go collect all the geodes you want. These Keokuk geodes are really fascinating. They come with 20 known minerals in it. And uh, some of them have oil, petroleum in it. You crack them open, the black crude runs out all over your hand. Uh, and then there's some other minerals that have been reported, but they haven't really been published. So these make for some really spectacular geodes. And I can, I can sit here for five minutes and show you pictures of, of geodes that are just, just beautiful. If you want a chance to go visit some of these, oh, and they get very big sometimes too. So if you want to collect some of these, this is a kind of a fun event. This, is, uh, this year it's going to be September 28th, 29th, and 30th. It's called Geode Fest, and it's held in Hamilton, Illinois, but it's actually sponsored by the town of Keokuk. And they, they, they hold it in Hamilton because Hamilton is where the quarries are uh, over there. So you get with these groups. They take you out into some of these quarries. You can actually dig around like these people here, and you can fill up your buckets with geodes and, uh, and have a good time come back and probably get them cracked for you. 
And if you're lucky, your kids won't find one of these. <laughs> I don't want to be the one carrying that guy. Boy, that would be heavy. <laughs> so uh, in West Burlington, at, at, at uh, Our Lady of Grace Grotto, this is at the St. Mary's Church, they had this beautiful grotto made out of cracked geodes. Uh, right there along the road, you can stop in and take a look at it. If you want to see some nice geodes, that's the place to go. Well, we're talking about grottos, of course. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Grotto of the Redemption in West Bend, Iowa here. But this is, uh, as a geologist, I can tell you this is one of the coolest places because this, uh, this Catholic priest here went around and collected rocks from all over the country and built this beautiful grotto out of all of these wonderful rocks. There's things like fluorite and, and uh, beautiful quartz crystals and all kinds of weird trees, and all of these are, are built out of rock, and it's really worth going to see. You can't collect there, of course, but really worth going to see that. If you want to go out of state, you could go somewhere like, uh, like down to Arkansas here and collect quartz crystals that look just like this. Pretty easy to do. But you've got to kind of be careful or you end up like me. This is my rock garden. Uh, this is a part of my rock garden. <laughs> and this is my garage, a part of my garage. So you can, get, you can get overwhelmed by these things, but, uh, but I still think it's a wonderful hobby. I was going to tell you one more thing before I, you, you get away here. Uh, our club, the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Society, has been promoting, starting last year, and we're going to push hard again this year, promoting the crinoid as Iowa State Fossil. Iowa is one of only 10 states that doesn't have a state fossil, and crinoid would be a wonderful item. What a crinoid is, it's an echinoderm, and they come in two forms, sea lilies, which look a lot like flowers, but they're actually living animals, and feather stars, which again, look like flowers until you see them swimming along through the ocean. Uh, they're relatives of starfish, sea urchins, brittle stars, she cucumbers, cucumbers, those are all echinoderms. Uh, this is a poster I put together for our last rock and mineral show. Just to show you what Iowa has in the way of crinoids, all of these spots on the map here are where crinoids were collected that are in the University of Iowa Museum. Those are museum quality crinoids collected all over those places. And these ones with the big yellow stars, those are world famous crinoid collecting spots with a few of the pictures of some of the crinoid fossils around there. So crinoid is a perfect thing to be Iowa State fossil. This is an example from the town of Legrand. Now, Crinoids are incredibly delicate creatures. Uh, they're made up of calcium carbonate discs, basically stacked together and held together with a little, little bit of a, a fiber thread. And then their head's up on top of there, their head here, and this is a, a shaft that they're resting on. When those guys die, in about a day, they totally disarticulate into a lot of pieces. And that's what you find most of the time. Lots and lots of crinoids around Iowa, mostly just little pieces. But some places like this, uh, they're preserved uh, in exquisite detail. Now these things to be buried, like to preserve like, get back there. To get preserved like this had to be buried catastrophically. Probably a, a giant hurricane or something came by and brought a bunch of mud over and buried them alive because that's the only way you'd get this. And these, these are just incredible. These fossils are featured in all kinds of magazines. These are a couple professional journals that have pictures of the crinoids from La Grande, Iowa. So this is why we want to make the crinoid the state fossil. Now most state fossils are very specific. It'll be a specific species of crinoid. Well, we don't want to do that because there's so many different good ones. We're just going to call it the crinoid period. So uh, this is our mascot. This is Floyd the crinoid, or Floyd the noid. And Floyd says, uh, tell your legislator that we want crinoids as our state fossil. So we'll be working on this this year. This is my typical sunset picture. I'll be glad to answer any questions. And I brought along a big collection of, of uh, miscellaneous rocks up here, including some of the ones I talked about. If you want to see them, feel free to come up and take a look. Anybody yeah. have any questions? What a one of the things we have to do is ask our questions into the microphone so the oh. people watching at home can hear your question as well as his answer, because otherwise they just hear the answer and they get confused. And I have a question. Yes, ma'am. What got you started collecting rocks? How did you catch the rock bug, so to speak? Well, I've kind of collected everything all my life, you know. I've got, 
I got a lot of collections of things. And so when I was a kid, I was collecting rocks, but I wasn't particularly interested. I went to the University of Iowa to pursue a degree in mechanical engineering. But uh, that was back in the 60s, and I didn't realize what a lousy mechanical engineering department they had back in the 60s. So I started casting around for a new career and uh, took a geology course. And boy, was it interesting. And not only that, the instructors were really interested in teaching and us learning. It was really fun. So I took another one. And pretty soon I was a geology major. And then pretty soon I had a PhD. So <laughs> that's how it works. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Doesn't anybody want to be on TV? Yeah. <laughs> well, now, I'm going to remind you all to go upstairs after you've looked at all of I'm these. I'm sorry, we have a question oh, back we here. We have a question. She has her own rock. All right. How old do you have to be to join the rock club? You can join it at any age. Although you probably ought to bring an adult along with you, so you have to drag your mom with you, I think. <laughs> I know my other question. Every year you have, is it every year you have the Rock and Mineral Show? That's right. We have the biggest Rock and Mineral Show in the Midwest, really. And it's in what month usually? Uh, April. April? Yeah. Okay. And you can find it on the C Cedar Valley Rock Cedar and Valley Mineral Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Show Society mm -hmm. webpage. Or if you just look for the Cedar Rapids Rock Show, their website comes up. And if, you, if it doesn't come in front of you some other way. We try to publicize it, and then we're failing. So we, we'll try to publicize it. But it's a really wonderful rock show. We have uh, 30 dealers or so that are there with a wonderful variety of rocks. We have uh, speakers. We have displays. We have things for kids to do. We have raffles and drawings and all kinds of things. So come and have a good time. Yes, ma'am. What was the best rock or fossil you've ever found? Oh, don't ask me that question. I love them all. <laughs> I love them all. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things that I, I did when I, I worked for the state of Iowa as a geologist for a lot of years is I got to study meteor craters. We have a couple meteor craters in Iowa. You don't know much about them anymore. But uh, probably some of my favorite fossils were the fossils that I found associated with meteor impacts. And those aren't really animal fossils. Those are fossils indicative of a meteor impact. You get things like shatter cones, the little pointed things and stuff. It's very cool. Now, if you guys haven't seen the display upstairs in the glass display case, take the stairs or the elevator up to the second floor, and it's right when you get out. And those are more, I don't want to call them fancier, because these are pretty too, but they're <laughs> lots of crystals and geodes and all sorts of stuff. And mm, almost everything in that display case is rays. I snuck one of my rocks in. But they're all rays, and they're beautiful. So you should go up and look at them. You have a question? It'll be up for the rest of the summer. Well, until the end of July. Is there obsidian upstairs? In Is that there a what? Obsidian? Yeah. yeah. So can we find that in Iowa? No. OK. No. Obsidian, you have to be near a volcano for obsidian. That's a very rapidly cooled lava. It cools so fast, it doesn't have time to form any crystals, so it forms a glass. And that's what obsidian is. And, uh, and it doesn't travel well in glaciers, so you don't find it in Iowa. But it was made in, Native Americans made it into tools, is that Yeah, right? yeah, because you can nap it just like you can uh, uh, agate or something like that, or chert. So yeah. it would be, if you traded it, you could get it yeah. into Iowa. Yeah, so, okay. yeah, it could come in that way, and I'm sure it has. Sure, yeah, talk to our friends down the, the display upstairs is not limited to Iowa. It's limited no. to really cool rocks. <laughs> That's what I asked him for was really cool rocks for the display. And when you see the, I'm already forgetting, the amethyst. Amethyst. It's like half a piece of cantaloupe, and it's got all these really cool purple crystals sticking out of it. So if you haven't seen the display, you should go upstairs and check it out. That piece of amethyst is from Brazil. Did I well, say that on it? It's still Probably. pretty. <laughs> so, feel, like he said, feel free to come up and look at and touch his rocks and ask him questions. But I would like to thank you, Ray, for coming. And if you want to hear more about Ray, not this Saturday, next Saturday at the Devonian Fossil Gorge, he and the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Club will be there. And then you're doing the, the geode one too, right? Yeah, a lot of people will be here for the geode one. So we'll hope Ray will bring some geodes that we can actually bust open. 
And if any of you are interested in the Cedar Valley Rock and Mineral Society, you know, we welcome everybody. Uh, our meetings are usually Tuesday evening in Cedar Rapids, uh, third Tuesday of the month. Uh, the summertime, we don't have formal meetings, we have picnics. So we have three picnics, June, July, and August. And uh, you can get on our website and see where they'll be. You're welcome to come. And we do something at each of these. This first one, we're going to cut and polish some stones. Second one, we're going to crack geodes. And the third one, we're going to play bingo. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ray. This was thank awesome. You, Beth.